pretty good. Well, thank you. And uh, I'm actually not going to do a, a really a talk. I'm actually going to ask a couple of provocations. Um, but I'm going to begin since you, I think it was you, Dan, who uh, alluded to Cabral, the great African revolutionary, uh, uh, talking about never forget, he says, that people are not fighting for abstract ideas in their heads. Like, like they, uh, they endure what the struggle demands of them to make a better life for themselves and their children. Uh, and uh, regardless of the lofty words, uh, if the movement does not actually make material improvements in people's lives, they mean fucking nothing. And I think that that's, I really want to anchor that. And I want to take the opportunity, and I dropped it into the chat, to really start off with yet another of uh, Cabral's, uh, uh, oh, did, yeah, yeah, I did I drop it in there. Mass no difficulties, mistakes, or failures claim no easy victories. So I say that because I want to actually share my screen for just a moment to take you to, am I sharing my screen? I am not, but I will be just one moment. Let me share, hit that button again. Um, share uh, my screen. And I think you are now looking at a part on the Cooperation Humboldt website. Uh, from May of this year, which basically announces that Cooperation Humboldt is in a, quote, strategic hiatus uh, to uh, uh, Cooperation Humboldt as an experiment uh, is at the moment, at least, uh, completely on pause. Um, now, I have my own perspective on why I am no longer on the board of directors. I am no longer an employee. I am no longer involved in Cooperation Humboldt. I now work as the advancement manager for the Wiat Tribes Dishkama Humboldt Community Land Trust, a cutting edge new approach uh, to create a, uh, a land trust under a federally recognized tribe to be a component unit. And we have already um, uh, facilitated multiple private land back uh, experiments. We've gotten several public land backs uh, using state and federal money. I am, even as we speak, we're just now beginning a project, which is a $14 million project to build 39 units of housing for currently houseless youth uh, with a priority in centralizing indigenous uh, youth. In other words, I have shifted uh, and the reason that I'm saying this uh, is because I think that I would never call Cooperation Humboldt a failure, uh, but I would say it, it was an experiment that yielded data, and it was very valuable data. And I want to say, for example, if you had asked me uh, like, like uh, 10, 15 years ago, would I be spending a lot of time at either a community land trust or building worker-owned cooperatives? I would have said something like this. Man, I'm glad those things exist, but I'm a serious revolutionary. I'm trying to reorganize and restructure all of society. And so, you know, just like I know, and that all of us know, we can't recycle our way into ecological sustainability, uh, I I didn't think then that we could co-op our way uh, into overturning capitalism. Um, and I say that because I want to stay humble uh, and say, okay, so I've shifted my thinking uh, and because I'm constantly pushing myself to better understand. But that's because I genuinely believe, and I'm not trying to break my arm patting myself on the back, but I integrate, I live my politics and I live by the principle of praxis. And for those of you who may do the reading, like I actually authored that piece, right? Like, like I, I got everybody's uh, buy-in, buy so it was a long list of folks, but I was the principal architect. And I say all the time, y'all, look at here. Theory without practice, that's mere contemplation. Practice without theory, that's just doing shit. And maybe something good will happen, but it will be by accident, right? It, it, like like the, the sweet spot is where you have a theory that's grounded in 
an understanding of the world. Because remember, a theory is just an explanatory set of principles and values. Like everybody has a theory, but almost nobody has a conscious intentional theory. Right. In other words, we just assume that, oh, well, things happen this way. They are our theory is mostly set by our parents or by the larger superstructure or society. We haven't actually sat down and say, well, this is my theory of actually how the world operates. Right. So what I love about a study group like this and what I'm committed to is let's actually get a theoretical grounding on how we understand how the world operates. And that is, in my language, the reality, the objective reality of white supremacy and capitalism and heteropatriarchy and settler colonialism are lenses of, at their core, power over dominator extractive worldviews, right? That's the lens by which I see everything. And that is not a checkmark intersectionality, but a, a lens by which I understand how the, the social reproduction actually occurs, how society is, is recreating itself and why. And it's why I think it's so critical that if we don't, for me, I always centralize with the class struggle, not class as in socioeconomic class, but who fucking owns shit? Like who is the owning class? And where is my relation to that? Right. And where are the people's uh, relation to that? So I'm giving you this backstory to say, if you have a theory, then you. All right. So the theory should then be say, all right, then let's make some some um, some plans of action, some strategic interventions. Right. And then you do that in order to put into practice that plan. And here's the kicker. That's where praxis comes in the willingness to constantly ask yourself, what did I learn? Since the theories are supposed to be explanatory or predictive, was I correct? Like, did, did the things that I thought would happen, did they happen? Did I undermine uh, white supremacy? Did I, did I build some level of power? And I think that for me, the praxis is always to be willing to be intellectually humble to say, and constantly readjusting my own theory and and readjusting my practice, right? Like, because there is a real danger, in my humble opinion, about dogmatism and sectarianism that seeps in to constantly, and like I'm a recovering alcoholic, so we got this fraying, like that to do the same thing over and over and ex expect different results is literally the definition of insanity. Right. And I just see so much on, you know, I used to call it the beret crowd wearing left. Some of us are old enough to remember, you know, I think that that some of us will remember like that moment, like right in the late 80s, early 90s, where, you know, RCP folks were, you know, or or, or like the, the success of the movement is based on like how many of those damn papers did uh, did you sell? Right. What I'm getting at is, yeah, I saw it. I see the I see the chuckles. Right. Like, you know what I'm talking about. Right. And so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, what I I'm do. Getting at is is this, y'all, and because I, I, I do want to stop, uh, but but cooperation Humboldt yielded some amazing data and some really uh, amazing things came out of it. But remember, I said if you had asked me 10, 20 years ago about co-ops, now my current theoretical understanding is it's it's informed by a rediscovery of Antonio Gramsci and really understanding the war of maneuver versus the war of position and where we are in this conjuncture. Because here's the thing, we are in a, a, a moment that no humans have ever been in before. And I mean this really seriously because like, look, empires fall. If I had to, uh, to, uh, to condense down like in, like in a short pithy sentence, right? What can we draw from the conclusion of the study of, of, of human history? I really could do it in three words. All empires fall, right? That's a, that is a truism. And they, they fall because of imperial overshoot in a nutshell, right? Like the, the empire goes out, exploits, extracts, sucks up the resources, builds up the empire. The empire then has been built up. So the supply chains have to go out, exploit, extract, you know, fuck people over. It's just, it's horror, right? Like all empires suck. 
I mean, the English Empire is particularly bad, says this descendant of the Scotch Irish, right? Like, and I, so I love English people, but I hate the English Empire. All I'm saying is <laughs> imperial overshoot, right? That's why empires fall. But every other time that an empire fell in world history, the surviving humans just drifted off into the mountains or the savannas or the valleys or the jungles or whatever it was. There's no place to go when we confront the horror of a global empire that is in clear overshoot. The ecological collapse is not coming. It's here accelerating and getting worse. That's one crisis of existential proportions. But wait, here's a second existential crisis. Capitalism is not just in late stage, it's now in end stage. By that, I mean, not just the existential crisis that we're consuming Mother Earth faster than she can replenish herself. That is true. That is an existential crisis, but that's the ecological component. Stay with me because the economic crisis of end stage capitalism means capitalism, even for the capitalist, is coming to an end because at its core, it demands the extraction of the surplus value of the laborer uh, to provide the profits uh, for the capitalist. But with automation, technology, robotics, AI, this, this new moment that we're in, I, 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 we are watching the political economy beginning to transform. And even if presto changeo, there was some technological fix, which I do not believe is coming, but even if there was a technological fix uh, to, uh, to, to solve the ecological crisis, there's no way for the capitalists to extract the surplus value of the labor. So that's why it's the third crisis, the political crisis of rising fascism is because the velvet glove of the neoliberal state is now coming off because there's no, uh, like petty bourgeoisie democracy can no longer be used to control the state. See the ruling elite, like when I say political crisis, I don't mean like it's because the, 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 the state apparatus and the superstructure, like it, it can't handle the, those first two existential crises. To be clear, the state and the petty bourgeoisie democracy was never designed to solve white supremacy or heteropatriarchy. I'm saying something different. I'm saying the state can no longer do what it's designed to do, which is maintain order. Fascism is rising. It's fascism is not just jackbooted thugs, right? It's it is literally a political ideology about how to organize society. It is at its core nationalism. It is it has descriptive uh, characteristics, but the point I'm making is fascism is rising now for the same basic reason it arose in the 1930s, because the entire society in the 1930s was shifting from a, an agrarian society to an industrial one. And everything was chaotic and up for grabs and fascists had a plan. This is how they said we should order society. Communists and leftists had a plan. No, here's how we should organize society. The neoliberal state is neither one of those, right? My point is the neoliberal state, I think, is in crisis because now in this new reordering of society, moving from the industrial age to whether you call it the knowledge technology or AI or uh, like whatever you call it, my point is, friends, that society is being reorganized. And I'll, I'll conclude with this before I open it up. I am not typically a binary thinker at all. I think everything is way more complex and there are more gradations and so forth. But on the whole, I think that we are really entering in that stage now where as the neoliberal center collapses, there's gonna be some version of eco-socialism or some version of fascism. Now, I personally, with my political orientation, I am an anarcho-communist, uh, but, I don't use that in, in my organizing because if I go to the pool hall and bowling alley and say anarcho-communist unite, they think I'm a fucking idiot, right? It does, the words don't, that doesn't mean anything to most people. And I really, like, I'm not, again, I'm not trying to break my arm, pat myself on the back, but I can go into a pool hall and a bowling alley and talk about all these ideas. 
I don't use some of the language I use here because we can use specific words precisely to really underscore it. But you know what I can do is say, man, don't you think the boss man's got his boot on your neck? Like, don't you think these rich bastards uh, would just as soon shoot us uh, as they, like, I can have, like, I think I have an ability to have that kind of pop ed political education that I think is needed. So I'm going to turn it over to y'all in, in rounds. But before I do, my suggestion, if I lived in LA, I would, it's a sobering thing because like, there's what? Four million in the city and nine million in the county, motherfucker! Like, how are you gonna? Like, I don't even. I can't wrap my head around that. I do think that I've heard from several of you. If I were there, like, uh, I think you're the one who who kicked it off, Richard. This concept. If I were there, I'd want to. Like, ideally, I'd like it to be in my neighborhood where I live, work, play, and pray. But I would say, let's go to a particular place, even if we have to import ourselves and let's begin a process of making people's material needs, like meeting material needs with a clarity of constant political education. Because I don't think that you can be a serious revolutionary if you're not committed to an ongoing intellectual struggle as well. So you can ask if your theory is working. So again, I'm gonna stop talking. I'm going to uh, ask for a, a round. I'm going to be paying close attention, so I won't interrupt at all. But if any of you have uh, specific questions or comments to me, please make them. And I'll turn it over to you, Yvonne, I guess, or, or Dan, I'm not sure who, to, to please run the rounds, and put me last, and I'm going to uh, take some notes as, as we go. So we, we do only have 15 left. And we ah, okay. we want to, we want to save at least five of that for announcements. So I reckon lightning rounds. Um, is, how does that sound to you, Yvonne? Yeah, cool. I'm just gonna be that guy because I'm already speaking, and I'm I'm just gonna go first just to keep this moving, and then you know then I might pass if if that's okay. Um, yeah, look, I don't know. Love, thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, I thank you. It's it's super instructive to hear the overarching stuff, but also like the minutia, you know, of like, what are our people up north doing? Um, and to hear like the organizational stuff is, yeah, I'll, I'll totally uh, dig more into that. I guess the only thing that I'll sort of like highlight out of what you just said, and again, like I've lived in Los Angeles for 10 years now at this point, and I feel like I am partly through having a child who goes to public school here, beginning to earn my way into saying something about this place <laughs> right you know that like yeah i got opinions now and they're based on not on nothing right as my kids gone gone through school and stuff and i live here um but like yeah that idea of like the sort of the scale of los angeles as a world right and and to think about it in ways right without you know, to recognize the work that is happening and the work in its great diversity, right, that is happening, right, that this doesn't necessarily require um, a vanguard organization to go in somewhere, right, um, that work is happening all over the place, but but perhaps in how to facilitate it. Um, yeah, I, I what I wanted to highlight that I really loved about what you were talking about was in relation to praxis, right? In relation to study and action and praxis, right? And thinking about like the way that you framed that as a, almost as a science, I don't know that you use the word science, but as a scientific process, right? But a scientific process that is not positivist, right? Like we are not looking for the one true God-given answer, which is not to say that there isn't reality somewhere here, but that I really love the way you sort of talked about, did it work? right? We had a theory about a thing. It was going to do this thing. It was going to make lives better in this way, right? And, so, and maintaining that focus of like, this is about lives being better, right? Not about who is the most hardcore and who has read the most or whatever, but like, is your life good, right? And had a theory, went and did a thing. Did it work? right which is like maybe that like maybe some of us have been trained by these nonprofits in a certain way to be like assessment's important <laughs> you know you need to assess the thing like did it do what we thought it would and it never will have and so what exactly happened what occurred when we did the thing but what I like there is that it's not about there 
being one true way, right? That there is not some historical truth that we have yet to find about the perfect society that will work in all circumstances for all people across all time, right? That there really is about like a, a pragmatic um, understanding that people do not live in the same circumstances, they don't live under the same regimes, and that the same answers are not going to work necessarily everywhere, but that these principles can guide what may look somewhat different in local circumstances and across time. It, what I also what you were saying there, this of the continual evaluation, right, is the idea that things may change across time as well. The models that work for us today are not necessarily eternal, um, but that we are clear about what we're fighting for and that that can be reassessed as we go on. Okay. That was more than I thought I would say. Um, I'm going to pass to Yvonne because she's next to me on the list. Uh, I'll pass in the interest of time. Um, I just, it's, it's about 7.20 right now. So we want to, we want to end at 7.25. So uh, Richard is next. Well, given the shortage of time, I'll be brief, but uh, I, I did want to say one thing that I heard a couple of weeks ago on a radio program, they were talking to uh, Michio Kaku, the theoretical physicist, who used to have a radio show called Science for the People, by the way, and they asked him about uh, artificial intelligence and what that meant, and he said, well, in its present state, uh, it is going to start taking away jobs that involve repetition, so when it's combined with robotics, any job that is if, like an assembly line, a dishwasher, uh, jobs of that sort will be the first to go. And those are the people that are the canary in the coal mine. So when you see that happening, you know that it's going to really uh, develop exponentially after that. So he said, keep your eye on that and be prepared to organize resistance. That's it for me. We've just got Dominic and Philip left. Uh, hi. Um, so, uh, uh, David, this question be, can be addressed to you, but I'm um, kind of also to the group. I was wondering if anyone had any thoughts on strategies for um, building and maintaining solidarity in such a diverse area as Los Angeles. Um, the reason this is top of mind for me is like I started in the environmental movement um, and I think of all the the lefty uh, uh, areas of focus, like environmentalism has historically been like for rich white people. Um, and I'm starting to feel that tension within groups I organize with that we don't have cross-class solidarity. We don't have the same material conditions. And so it makes feeling safe and it makes feeling aligned difficult. Um, and so, I, yeah, just thoughts on 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 that. And, and again, given um, LA's hugely diverse population and just huge population in general. And Philip, I don't want to rush you, but one or two minutes. Very good. I want to compliment David Cobb's work with the indigenous communities. I think that work is really very important. And I want to compliment him on that. Um, so I also felt really good to hear about the ideas of keeping theory and practice related because we can't really work with one without the other. And I think that's very important. Working with people from where they are is an important tool for organization. Beginning with their ideas makes what or make organizations grow. And for Dominica, for who, there are organizations out there all over the place, even in East Los Angeles, for example, dealing with environmental issues. Maybe you could find one or two and you could be able to put the contact together. Yes, we are a broad community, but when I was growing up in Boyle Heights, I felt it a little village. And each little community that we have in our LA is like a little village. There are people there that want to do things and are doing things. We just have to identify them like Yvonne did with, their, with the Solidarity Research Census and, and, and identify them and start working with them. And I think that is a good sign for future development, for change. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. David, you get like two whole minutes, maybe three. No, I don't because I want to hear from Richard. 
<laughs> right, right, Richard. I'm skipping over Richard. You're up. I, I, I did say my piece briefly about AI earlier, but since I get the since I'm on the list anyway, I, I really appreciated what you had to say, David. It all made a lot of sense to me. And um, I was going to write in chat to Dominique, check out the book Climate Change as Class War, which addresses a lot of those issues that you mentioned about the climate movement, where uh, the author Matt Huber uh, talks about uh, different class elements that are involved in. Um, oh, you're reading it right now. Excellent. She's reading it right now. Good. So I recommend that to everybody. It's not it's not a perfect book. I don't agree with everything that he has to say in it, but he does analyze the class background of the climate change movement very precisely and excellently. So yeah, we have uh, we are in exactly that we we are on the cusp of the of I think um, what Chalmers Johnson called. He said we're going to see like an, uh, we're we're in we're in a phase of imperial overreach. And he did talk about this in his uh, his Empire trilogy, and uh, you know how we address this uh, is important, and um, and I'm glad that uh, David has brought that to our attention. That's all I have to say. I'll do it really quickly. I got one minute to tell you this. Please continue to engage in the study so that it can make your whatever practice you end up doing more effective. Like I tell people all the time, like study is action, right? Uh, but uh, it is also not the same thing. Like study is not going to make somebody's material life better. Study is action, but uh, you've got to do both. So I hope y'all will stay together. And then I hope y'all will find a couple of projects that you can do together uh, to, to, to have an experiment. Thank you. Yay. Thank you.